Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are joining us from today. We're delighted to have you here with us uh, for today's webinar and fireside conversation hosted by Edge Cortex as a part of the Edge AI Summit series. This September, we're going to be back in person for Edge AI Summit after three years of virtual events. And for the first time ever, we are going to be co-locating with AR Hardware Summit. What this essentially means is 800 plus machine learning, hardware and system specialists under one roof. We'll have keynote addresses from leading experts at the likes of Meta, UPS, AWS, Numenta, many, many more. Over 40 industry experts speaking with dedicated streams covering both vision and NLP and speech. And domain focused discussion groups looking at the latest innovation and challenges across healthcare, automotive, agriculture, and industrial manufacturing. And being back in person, of course, we packed in over eight hours of formal and informal networking, including for the first time, the AR Hardware and Edge AI Summit meet and greet. But before September, we're joined today by Sakya Dasgupta, founder and CEO of Edge Cortex, and veteran industry expert, Mike Demler. And we're gonna be discussing software, the elephant in the room for Edge AI hardware acceleration. If you have questions throughout today's discussion, please submit them using the ask question function on the platform. If we don't manage to get to all the questions, Sakura and Mike will follow up with you post webinar via email. The slides will not be sent round after the presentation. So if you are interested in receiving them, please do follow up directly with Edge Cortex, but you will be able to view the, uh, the, the webinar after today on demand. Finally, if you're intrigued by what you hear today, and we hope you are. I wanted to let you know that Sakya will be presenting on panels on behalf of Edge Cortex in both the Edge AI Summit and the AR Hardware Summit. And I know he looks forward to meeting as many of you there in person as he possibly can across the three days. So we all look forward to seeing you in September in Santa Clara. And now, without further ado, Sakya, Mike, I'm going to hand over to you. My page froze. I can hear you, Mike. Clear. Aaron froze. Uh, can you still hear me? I can hear you. I can hear you. And I see the audience view, but Aaron went away. <laughs> yeah, I, I think. I'm, um, I'm uh, still here in the background. Okay. Are we live, Aaron? Yeah, I'm still here in the background. You're good to go, Mike. Okay. <laughs> Sorry for the glitch. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, as Aaron said, I'm Mike Demler. I am a very long time uh, semiconductor uh, industry veteran. And uh, most recently, I was with the Lindy Group and Microprocessor Report, where I was the, uh, the lead analyst for automotive edge AI uh, technologies. And I'm here with, with Sakia Dasgupta. Uh, prior to founding Edge Cortex, Sakia has spent more than a decade performing R&D in areas like uh, brain-inspired computing, robotics, computer vision, hardware acceleration. His previous experience includes positions at Microsoft, IBM Research, and other national research labs like Riken and, and Max Planck Institute. Um, before we get started, I'd like to just go over the flow of the webinar. Our objective is to help the audience understand uh, the critical role that software plays in edge AI inference. And Saki will present how uh, Edge Cortex's technology addresses those requirements, but we actually plan to spend most of our time in an interactive Q&A session, and we encourage the audience to, to participate in that. So please uh, enter your questions in the Q&A box, and we'll get to as many of them as we can after his, his brief presentation. Uh, to kick this off, uh, let's start with a slide I like to use to talk about Edge AI. Um, because I want to make sure that everybody understands what it is we're referring to. Uh, you hear the word edge and might think of a boundary, but, but over time, uh, the edge has grown to actually occupy a very large and, and diverse region of the computing space. And you'll see some people will refer to the edge and they're referring to the, to the network edge. And, and we have some uh, edge AI inference applications there where things like on-premises servers used in video surveillance systems, for example where uh, 
you're not uploading all the data to the cloud, you're doing local uh, edge AI inference. But other people refer to the edge in, in terms of, say, the, the uh, connection to, to the physical uh, space uh, with sensors in smart buildings, smart cities, smart homes. Uh, you go from the servers all the way down to small battery powered devices that run milliwatts or even microwatts. So you have a very, very large range of space in terms of performance requirements. And, and it even includes automotive, uh, which uh, more and more are becoming like smartphones on wheels. And so uh, to cover that space is, is a challenging problem. You can see this, there's no possible one size fits all. Uh, if you know that you only have one application, perhaps you can use a dedicated ASIC. But if you need fast time to market, uh, if you need the flexibility of, of installing new models and, and doing lots of frequent updates, you might want an FPGA. And so the issue that we'll be addressing is how do you target multiple different hardware platforms and have a consistent software platform so you don't need to learn a new set of tools every time you develop a new product. And these are the issues that, that Saki and Edge Cortex are addressing. And so that's that's his company's focus. And so now, Saki, I'll turn over you to uh, to give the audience an overview of your technology. Thanks, Mike. Um, I could not have summarized that better in terms of uh, putting the context of Edge AI uh, systems really in place. Uh, so as you described, you know, the objective here is to have more of a fire chat, uh, side chat. Um, and I'm looking forward to take a lot more questions. So what I'll do first is I'll walk through uh, some of the key aspects of what we really mean by software being the elephant in the room, and then hopefully uh, we can you know, get to the more interesting questions. Uh, but before that, uh, as you described, the edge is really, um, you know, there is no one size that fits all, or inherently there is a heterogeneity that exists in that edge AI system space. And we as a company, we are focusing on enabling a full stack solution uh, that can bring a lot more performance as well as efficiency for edge AI systems. And what system really means is that you got to have a combination of, of software and hardware, but software really is fundamentally one of the critical factors that most often than not is missing for many solutions that we see on the pure semiconductor side. So we as a company, we are focusing on enabling such efficient edge systems on different types of uh, hardware platforms, including FPGAs and custom silicon like ASIC, covering the entire gamut of edge AI landscape, applications like automotive sensing, smart city, uh, drones, robotics, uh, essentially the entire space of um, power efficient uh, edge AI applications. And we do this uh, with from three different angles. Uh, fundamentally, it's driven by a software stack that we'll talk about a lot more but really the objective here is to contextualize the broader question of what you require in a typical software. And we are contextualizing that with our software Mera, which is a heterogeneous platform. Using that software, we uh, designed our first silicon, which is Sakura. We have talked about that quite a bit in previous occasions, uh, but Sakura essentially delivers a significant performance per watt advantage or energy efficiency advantage as compared to GPUs or other types of accelerators that you see in the market today. And a bulk of that is being driven by the software stack. And Sakura inherently contains our core IP, uh, which is essentially a deep learning accelerator or domain specific process architecture called dynamic neural accelerator, which uh, can be embedded on FPGAs as well as on custom silicon. And in this case, it is one of the core components of Sakura. But fundamentally, software is the critical step that is required to extract most value out of both DNA as well as Sakura as a chip. So without further ado, let's jump to that main question, which is software, the critical challenge, and how we as a company have been uh, trying to solve that uh, challenge. So before getting into uh, you know, what Mera as a software entails, let's talk about this heterogeneity problem that we alluded to. If you look at uh, software for edge AI systems today, or in general, the edge AI systems landscape, it's really a highly heterogeneous space, which means that there are various different components that one has to take into account. On the left-hand side, you will see that we have, you know, we can source our AI applications or models from a wide range of different frameworks. It could be PyTorch, it could be TensorFlow Lite, or it could be ONNX, where you're moving between different frameworks 
So there is already an inherent heterogeneity in the different machine learning frameworks that exist today. So you not only have to contend with that for any software that you bring to the market, you also have to contend with the fact that very typically, uh, and in, in most production scenarios, you're not just deploying a standalone processor, but it, in most cases has to work alongside either an existing x86 system, it could be Intel, AMD, or it could be an ARM-based system that you're deploying your accelerator to work alongside, or it could even be FPGAs or even GPUs. In many cases, we have seen for customer scenarios, uh, you know, the customer does not uh, you know, they are not looking to replace the GPU necessarily, but are looking to bring a lot more AI acceleration, either through FPGs or some other dedicated AI accelerator uh, in a, uh, you know, a custom silicon, silicon form. And in that case, you might have a very heterogeneous system where you have a CPU, you have a GPU, and then you have an additional accelerator in place. And then, of course, you have heterogeneity that, you know, Mike talked about in terms of the different applications. You could be applying this to smart city in terms of cameras, which could be very different in terms of a sensor as compared to a LiDAR sensor that is a lot more prevalent in automotive applications. And you need a software stack that can cut across heterogeneity of frameworks, heterogeneity of different hardware platforms, and even the heterogeneity of application. And that is a tall order. So how do you actually start solving that problem? We as a company, we took a stab at that with what we call Mera. And fundamentally, one of the critical requirements to uh, solve that heterogeneity challenge is to embrace open source uh, and standards that we have now seen emerging in the market. And a couple of these standards are Apache TVM that already exists as an open source compiler framework, and as well as MLIR, which is another intermediate representation. What we did is that embracing open source standards, we build on top of that, enabling us to not only support all the different types of frameworks that we talked about, uh, namely PyTorch, TensorFlow Lite, ONNX out of the box, we are also able to add acceleration alongside existing hardware platforms or general purpose processes like ARM, Intel x86, AMD, or even RISC-V, which is a critical component of most production systems where you, you would be deploying this uh, on an edge workload. And then finally, the actual acceleration would be deployed either on an FPG. So out of the box, Mera as a software takes that heterogeneity concept even further and enables us to bring AI acceleration through our dynamic neural accelerator IP onto FPGAs. We also support third-party silicon. So in many cases, you will find that uh, it's not just uh, a new silicon that you bring to market, but you might have existing silicon, like in this case, the Renaissance chips, which are now also employing our Mera software framework, uh, which might require acceleration and has to work even in that broader heterogeneous uh, context. And then finally, of course, we support our own custom silicon. And moving from FPGAs to third-party silicon to our own silicon, of course, we have to traverse different types of performance ranges. But the critical idea is that any software that we bring for AI acceleration needs typically to support different frameworks, different general purpose processors or you know, host processors, and then uh, be applicable across different platforms. With this in mind, so heterogeneity is the first challenge that one has to solve when it comes to software platforms, in our opinion, uh, for edge AI flexible workloads. But then there are a few other critical challenges. The second one is ease of use. In most real world workloads, uh, we have seen that customers have already existing applications or models that have worked very well for them, either in CPUs or GPU platforms. And you need to be able to port them very easily or flexibly onto any other newer acceleration platform that you're bringing, whether that's our silicon like Sakura, or it's an FPGA platform, or any other third party uh, silicon platform, being able to seamlessly port, uh, port a model from GPU to that platform is critically important. The second factor is, of course, performance. You know, while we add heterogeneity and ease of use, we don't want to sacrifice the performance that you get, and that's another critical aspect. We do that by enabling, essentially, the ability to uh, quantize the models at INT 8-bit representation that preserves significant amount of accuracy while still giving us a lot more performance benefit. And then, of course, the software has to work in an integrate, ma integrated manner with the underlying architecture 
or the IP that you have. In our case, of course, that's the dynamic neural accelerator. And then finally, accuracy is the fundamental challenge. So one of our design principles, again, driven by a lot of customer feedback, has been most customers don't want to change their models. They don't want to do retraining just to deploy that model um, uh, in production. Uh, as a result, when we design Mera as a software platform, we preserve the original model without having to retrain the model. And INT 8-bit representation plays a critical role in that as well, where you can still preserve most of your accuracy, typically within 99% of your 14.32 models or the baseline models. And then you don't have to retrain that model in order to deploy that on, onto the actual hardware. Along with that, uh, you know, these compiler frameworks and software stack like Mera also requires critically profiling tools. And that's one of the reasons why we built in place things like an interpreter simulator that I can talk about a lot more, uh, hopefully during the Q&A, which enables us to optimize uh, and tailor the solution even without access to the actual hardware. The fourth critical important factor uh, that we have seen uh, for software, which is very rarely addressed today, is the ability to access that software very easily. So one of the reasons why we decided to open source Mera was to make it broadly available for the general public. So in this case, you can go and try Mera uh, easily through um, our, uh, you know, the GitHub page where it's uh, open source, as well as uh, be able to uh, download that and try out different, different, uh, different platforms that are built into the Mera itself. What you'll see here on the bottom right corner, you'll see something called platform identifiers, these are different types of IPs that are pre-configured to work for different platforms, whether that's an FPGA or as ASIC or even the Sakura platform, which is our own silicon. Uh, the idea has always been to be able to provide easy uh, deployment, the ability to port existing models that are either part of libraries like Torch Vision or TensorFlow Hub, and then be able to test out and validate the performance and efficiency even before you go to the actual hardware. So that's all about the Mera framework and what are the different components that are there, but how do you actually deploy that in a real world scenario? So let's look at the three critical steps that we find necessary for ease of deployment. Essentially, you can take a model today and deploy that with Mera using a three simple process. The first step is to get a pre-trained model and that entails the ability to port a model or an existing application from any of the different frameworks like PyTorch, TensorFlow Lite, or even uh, ONNX, and then do a simple calibration process that can all run within the machine learning framework itself. As a result, you don't have to make custom changes to that model. You don't have to do retraining or even requantization uh, or quant uh, training of that model with quantization in mind, which can often change the accuracy. Once you have that pre-trained model, which was uh, probably trained on a GPU, you would then move to the compilation step, which essentially requires you to call some simple APIs. During that process, you can now select the platform, whether you're deploying this to an FPGA, or you're deploying to the Sakura chip itself, or you're deploying that to actual simulator, the profiling tools. Again, we are keeping the heterogeneity concept in mind, given that in many cases, you may not know what the actual performance is and whether you're matching your production requirements even before you go to silicon. And having targets which are built-in profiling tools enables you to do that quite easily. Once you have done that and you have done the compilation, it will then generate the uh, essentially the compiled binaries or compiled artifacts that you can take and then easily deploy on the actual hardware. Once again, keeping the heterogeneity concept in mind, once you have your compiled binaries, depending on the platform of choice, you can easily deploy this on either an FPGA target or an ASIC target or our custom silicon, in this case, Sakura. We even go forward to enable you to support x86 or ARM-based architectures, such that you have flexibility on what is the end platform where you're adding acceleration to. So that's a quick highlight on the different components of Mera, uh, and hopefully we can get into more deeper questions during the Q&A. So let me kind of go back to how does that all that software components tie that to the actual hardware? I'm not going to spend too much time talking about a silicon today, given software is the critical topic that we're trying to discuss here. 
But just to highlight quickly, that software that we described, that of course drives the actual silicon, which in this case is Sakura. Sakura is a chip that has around 40 tops of INT8 compute available in a single core configuration. And then you can have uh, up to 200 tops where you can have multi-chips within a single package. Uh, it provides essentially uh, a PCI-based interface uh, as well as uh, onboard uh, dual LPDDR4X 16 GB of memory that enables you to have uh, external memory, the ability to bring high resolution data that you can work with on that actual silicon. There are two form factors that are available initially in the form of a dual M.2 and a low profile PCI card. And most critically, the core component of this chip is the dynamic linear accelerator, which is a runtime reconfigurable IP, uh, which is again driven critically by the compiler stack to extract most value out of it. And in most real world tasks like uh, YOLO v3, YOLO v5, which are essentially standard complex object detection models, or even natively processing LIDAR data, we see latencies sub four milliseconds. So you get quite fast real time workloads while consuming very low power consumption, which in this case has a TDP of around 10 watts. So how does that actually look uh, in action? Um, let me go over a couple of use cases to see what that software component and that silicon together can deliver in real world use cases uh, on relatively complex workloads. The first use case that we look at is a use case of directly or natively processing 3D LiDAR data, which is one of the critical components of most automotive workloads or even uh, intelligent transportation systems. So let's go ahead and play the video where you will see the actual object detections in action and then we'll come back and take a look at the performance and efficiency numbers. So what you're seeing here is essentially uh, a LiDAR, 3D LiDAR detection model that can do object detection in, you know, 3D object detection of different types of objects, in this case, it's like cars, pedestrians, cyclists, et cetera, uh, at real time, in this case, you know, uh, at one millisecond, uh, or uh, I'm sorry, essentially under four milliseconds, so around 3.95 milliseconds uh, at batch size one, which is again a critical requirement for edge workload or edge processing. And if you were to compare that to an equivalent GPU processing, which in this case would be NVIDIA Xavier AGX, one of the leading GPUs that uh, is most commonly utilized for edge workloads, we see a, a speed up of 8.8x, nearly 9x speed up in terms of uh, latency. And then if you were to compare uh, the efficiency, which is the performance per watt or frames per second per watt, which is uh, significantly important than pure tops measurement, we see a lead of around 27x. A bulk of this is of course, you know, the IP itself has a critical role to play, but most importantly, without robust, flexible and ease of use software, we would be unable to extract as much value as you see in this application. In this case, we were comparing uh, NVIDIA AGX with Tensor RT, and in our case, everything is compiled by the, uh, with the Mera uh, software framework. So let's go ahead and see another example. In the next case, we'll look at a multi-stream scenario uh, for a, you know, a typical smart city environment. In this case, if you're interested to see the video, it's available uh, through, I think, a link that should be available through the same um, uh, interface that you're using. And uh, if you're interested, you can click on that link and it'll uh, take you to a YouTube page where you can see that entire video in action. What you'll see is that we are able to detect objects not only extremely fast, but also extremely accurately. Unlike the previous example where we were using a different framework, PyTorch, here we are putting natively a model that was developed or designed on a GPU platform. Once you had that pre-trained model, it was quantized to INT8 bit, all within the TensorFlow uh, framework, in this case, TensorFlow Lite. And once you have that model, we are still able to preserve 99% of the original FP32 accuracy. And then that is ported using the Mera compiler stack and placed on the Sakura chip. Once you have that, we are comparing running it live on Sakura under batch size one conditions and comparing that to once again, the same GPU, namely the NVIDIA Xavier AGX under batch size one conditions. In this case, unlike the previous example, 
uh, we see there is a 17x speed up in terms of the frames per second under bath size one conditions. And if you were to compare the frames per second per watt, which is your energy efficiency, we see a significant advantage in the form of 50x uh, when you compare it to the NVIDIA AGX. And one of the critical factors here, by the right combination of software and the hardware components, namely the runtime reconfigurability that we have on our chip, we are able to utilize majority of that compute, the 40 tops compute that's there on Sakura. And that's critically important. That utilization is critically important to extract a lot more efficiency benefit as compared to pure tops number. And that's the uh, key reason why we see the difference between Xavier versus Hcotic Sakura here. With that, um, let me uh, conclude the overview and then hopefully we can get to more questions and active discussions with Mike. So um, in conclusion, what we have seen here is robust software is critically important for AGI systems. Uh, we have talked about Mera, at least we have you know, seen an overview. We have talked about Mera as a software that you know, provides non-compromising ease of use, low latency inference, and most importantly, across heterogeneous platforms. We have also seen that bringing that software together with the right kind of IP, which in our case is of course the dynamic neural accelerator engine, enables us to get a lot better utilization uh, of the actual compute, which directly impacts the efficiency in terms of performance per watt. And then finally, we brought all of those together on the actual hardware uh, or silicon, which in our case is the Sakura chip, a TSMC 12 nanometer silicon semiconductor that enables 40 tops of compute uh, under INT8 representation, delivering in some cases on real world workloads, 50X advantage in terms of energy efficiency. But most importantly, the software is the critical driving factor to extract all of those values. And hopefully in the uh, you know, discussion section that we'll have now, we can go over what are those critical components of the software that enables us to get such performance and efficiency advantage. Over to you, Mike. Okay, well, thanks, Sakya. That was a great presentation. And I think the, the range of uh, the applications and, and uh, target devices that you can support uh, is, is impressive and, and, uh, and unique. Um, so again, uh, to the audience, don't be shy. Uh, go ahead and answer uh, any of your questions. I have, have a lot of questions. Um, maybe start at the front end um, in terms of, of the variety of frameworks that you support, that heterogeneity today in, in, the, uh, in the training frameworks that, that uh, developers use to create their models. Uh, has the industry settled on PyTorch and, and TensorFlow? Uh, how do you support the, the, the various frameworks uh, and, and does it present problems for both the users and for the compiler developers? How do you choose? Right, right. No, so that's a great question. So I think there is, um, you know, um, th there is no right answer to that. Um, in our design process, when, when we started off, um, we looked at the current standard frameworks, which happened to be PyTorch and TensorFlow. And of course, ONNX was an important component to allow portability or movement across those different frameworks. Where you know, if somebody is developing something in TensorFlow, and you still want to embrace PyTorch um, uh, or, or kind of deploy that a lot more flexibly, ONNX provides that um, you know ability to move between different frameworks. So, as a design principle, those three were the critical components that we started with, or the critical framework that we started with. In terms of actual applications. Um, I am, uh, you know, I, I, for me, PyTorch is a lot, uh, you know, I'm, I find that a lot more better designed uh, personally. However, I would say that in production, TensorFlow is, you know, has been utilized for a longer period. But if you were to compare in terms of the ability to move from research grade models all the way to production, I think uh, PyTorch provides the most flexibility. Uh, in terms of actual applications, um, I don't think there is any reason to choose one platform over the other. Uh, mm -hmm. From a software design perspective, especially for, for a company that's bringing AGI application systems, I think it's critically important that any software supports all of those different frameworks, giving the, uh, you know, the choice to the customer to decide what framework that they want to use and provide that flexibility out of the box. Sure, sure. That's, that's interesting perspective. Um, of course, there's dozens and dozens of, of AGI processor vendors now, and and they all offer 
or some sort of a compiler. Uh, but it, it's it's not as simple as it is as just uh, looking at that original computational graph and just saying that you support all the operators. Uh, how does what role does your software play in in maximizing the efficiency? Uh, it's not just a brute force compilation, is it? Right. No. So that that's that's yeah that's critically important, and I didn't have time to talk about that. So. Uh, fundamentally, the compiler, uh, you know, is, is when we say software is the elephant in the room, I would say e equivalently, the compiler is really the, you know, uh, the, the, the big, bigger elephant in the room because yeah. the software and the compiler kind of go hand in hand. Of course, we talked about PyTorch, TensorFlow of these frameworks, but inherently, it is the compiler that's able to extract the most value from whatever platform, hardware that we are deploying these models to. In our case, let me see, I might have a slide that will help illustrate that even better. So uh, on this slide, we talk about the Mera compiler and how we are able to essentially exploit multiple degrees of parallelism uh, that are prevalent in machine learning models, as well as multiple degrees of parallelism that might be available in the silicon architecture itself. In our case, of course, the dynamic neural accelerator. And two of the most important components uh, of essentially you know maximizing efficiency and performance from a compiler perspective is the ability to have flexible scheduling as well as the ability to uh, utilize on chip memory very effectively which in involves efficient memory allocation uh, in terms of the scheduling when we designed our mera platform we inherently took into account what are the different degrees of parallelism that may exist in a machine learning model so when you're deploying let's say a model like YOLO v3 or YOLO v5, it is very different from a model like a point cloud processing model, let's say um, point pillars, which have very different degree of parallelism and, and even inherent heterogeneity between the layers and operators as compared to the YOLO model. So you need to have the ability to utilize those different uh, operators a lot more effectively. For that, we have certain components that are baked into the chip in the form of runtime reconfigurability, but that uh, the, the the ability to do that is extracted by our scheduler, which inherently maximizes the overall utilization of the compute that's available on the chip. On the memory allocation side, uh, one of the bottlenecks that we have seen in uh, semiconductor design is the ability to pre-configure how you utilize the memory. If you have the ability to flexibly allocate memory, even at the silicon level, using that compiler that, that allows you to uh, have a lot more flexibility <clears throat> when you're deploying models, which may vary in the amount of space that it takes in terms of the parameters, the amount of space that it might take in terms of the different resolution of models. Uh, and we do this in, in, inherently inside Mera using an efficient memory allocator uh, that you know, at, at first tries to minimize the amount of time you would require to go from your, or the number of times you would go off chip so it's trying to essentially optimize full utilization of the on-chip memory, uh, reduce our energy expense by going off chip. It tries to effectively maximize memory bandwidth. You would also want the compiler to overlap your compute versus memory read-write operations such that you, know, you can uh, effectively gain a lot more in latency. Um, and then fundamentally, you want to minimize energy expenditure. And that ultimately gives you a lot more power efficiency. I would say those are a few components that are very critically important uh, components of the compiler stack to be able to extract a lot more efficiency and performance uh, out of the software. Right, right. So, yeah, so it's interesting. It's not just a compiler. You talked about it as a compiler framework. And, sure. and this shows, um, I think, the importance of, of the software hardware co-optimization. Um, there's a, there's a point on this slide I think is worth uh, <clears throat> maybe diving into a little bit more. Uh, I was going to ask you about, about the scheduler um, because people think about the compiler, but they often overlook the actual uh, real-time workload management. And, and sure. you have a unique feature here that you're, you're alluding to with the runtime configurability. And I know that this isn't about hardware per se, but that combination of how your software can maximize efficiency by con configuring the hardware. I think, could you collaborate on that? Sure, absolutely. So uh, so I would say this is as much a software fe feature as much a hardware feature. 
So if you look at this particular slide, let me use that first. And I think that you know, there is another slide that we can pull up to go into more details of um, the runtime reconfigurability. On this slide, you'll see that there's something called compute parallelism. And fundamentally, what we wanted to do is the ability to maximize utilization of the available compute on the chip uh, dynamically based on the actual workload that you're running on the chip. This, is, uh, this feature is enabled using essentially a runtime reconfigurable interconnect that we built into the actual accelerator that connects all the different computes that we have on the chip moving from left to right, such that using software at compilation time, we essentially decide how you would partition, let's say a, a fairly heterogeneous model like coin pillars here, which you, know, you can think of that as a compost of multiple different models in itself, uh, as well as between different layers, you can have quite varying different degrees of parallelism. For example, your uh, you know, when you're going from your early layers to your later layers, you typically have, uh, you know, a, a, a structure where you're going from larger channels to smaller channels or vice versa, and you would want to extract a lot more, um, the ability to partition that on the chip is critically dependent on that different degrees of parallelism that you have at the layer level or at the network level. And using this runtime reconfigurable interconnect, the compiler, at schedule time is statically scheduling uh, and deciding how you would place these different operators, the different layer, uh, how you would place the different layers onto the operate, uh, the compute that is available on the silicon. And then at runtime, it dynamically configures whether to group certain compute elements to work synchronously, and there would be others that would work completely asynchronously. As a result, you can maximize your compute utilization uh, or in some cases, you can shut down certain compute elements to save both power as well as uh, gain in terms of uh, energy efficiency uh, in terms of the performance per watt that you can get. So it's a mixture of the software and the hardware components together uh, in this runtime reconfigurability feature. Yeah, that's good. And that gives you that flexibility to support, like you're showing the LiDAR application as well as the traditional camera-based model. That's exactly right. So, uh, in fact, even within, um, you know, of course, when you're going from the LIDAR to, uh, let's say, an object detection model or something else, there is, of course, a, quite a significant difference in terms of types of operators. Uh, mm -hmm. But even within a, a network, so for example, let's take the example of YOLO v3. Even if you look at a single network, between layers, there's quite a lot of variance. And what feature like runtime reconfigurability with the software stack enables you to do is to decide how you partition those different layers onto that actual architecture, which in our case is of course a data flow uh, uh, array uh, architecture to extract a lot more utilization, which effectively increases your, if, uh, you know, your uh, energy efficiency in the form of performance per watt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, some of the other techniques that uh, uh, the processor vendors will employ uh, or software developers as well is, is things like sparsity, uh, layer merging. Uh, sometimes the sparsity figure uh, is, is deceptive because uh, the most networks in actual use uh, have, have a high degree of sparsity and, and the vendors will use that to inflate the performance spec. But uh, do you support uh, things like sparsity in the, your, uh, your uh, software? Okay, that's a great question, and there are two sides to that. So, um, let me see if I if I can pull up uh, the Mera overview slide. So, here we talked about a few different types of operators and different types of you know uh, features that are part of it, but we haven't specifically talked about sparsity here. And the reason being, there are two approaches that we have followed. The first being, typically, when you require sparsity, you have to make changes to your model in most cases. So you would either have to retrain that model with sparsity in mind, uh, or if you apply sparsity post-training, there's typically a degradation in accuracy that we have seen. So in most cases, the performance numbers that we are showing here are without sparsity. Having said that, the software does enable you, uh, allow you to have sparsity, um, uh, some form of structured sparsity to be uh, enabled. That will essentially allow you to skip zeros uh, and preserve uh, or reduce the energy expense uh, that you would have 
uh, and effectively reduce latency, given that you can, um, you know, if you have sparsity baked into your hardware architecture as well, you can uh, effectively maximize the amount of lim limited amount of on-chip memory that you have when you're deploying a model, which would mean that you're not going off chip as often. That's the area where we have found the most effective use of sparsity. In most majority of the cases, uh, other than uh, you know typical zero skipping, we don't apply uh, rigorous other sparsity mechanism, mainly because of the fact that it would require retraining as well as uh, in many cases, if, if you have to preserve the accuracy, you would have to retrain the model. And if you don't do that, you would you would see uh, accuracy degradations. Yeah, yeah, some, some people push it where it doesn't in fact affect the accuracy. Right, so uh, I, w I would say that, um, you know, uh, it, it's fairly well known that, um, of course, it depends on the level of sparsity. Like if you're talking about, you know, 5% sparsity, that's very mm -hmm. different versus 90% sparsity. But if you want to really gain something in terms of, you know, speed, size, you would have to have quite significant amount of sparsity in your models. And when we go for those approaches, in most cases than not, you would have to fine tune your model with sparsity in mind. The second aspect which you mentioned um, is sp sparsity, having sparsity can actually change or inflate your top numbers. And that's mm -hmm. something that we want to be cognizant of. So when we talk of 40 tops, that's the actual amount of compute that's available. That's not sparse tops. Uh, if you have sparsity, typically, you know, um, you, you can actually consider two operations rather than a single operation that would effectively mean that you have doubled your effective yeah. tops but that's not the true tops that stops yeah. with sparsity in mind and that's a distinction that is very important when customers look at uh, or compare different hardware or you know semiconductors yeah i think that's an important point i always encourage people to uh, if they're evaluating different uh, processors make sure that they they ask those questions because uh, no matter how you uh, compile the network, the hardware is the hardware, and it can only compute so many operations per cycle. Uh, it, there's nothing else that changes that. Yeah. That's exactly right. There, there yeah. is a fixed upper bound on the total amount of compute that's available without sparsity. Sure, sure. Okay, uh, I want to encourage the audience to continue uh, entering questions. We have uh, some time left. Uh, the question then, on, given the, the heterogeneity and 80 of the, um, of the applications, is integer eight sufficient for all those applications? Uh, do you have cases uh, in the edge where you might need greater precision? And how do you care? Yeah, I mean that. So it's two right. Really so, uh, yeah, sure. So uh, I think there are a couple of aspects to that. What we have seen is that the INT eight, of course, uh, is the right balance. It's almost an industry standard now, in, uh, from a perspective that it does not require in all in majority of the cases to do retraining. If you have a model that was trained on, let's say, floating point 32 or even FT16, uh, choosing INT 8-bit representation enables us to uh, reduce you know, the, the size of the model quite drastically, well, four times in this case, uh, without losing accuracy in most cases. And in order to do that, we typically follow a calibration step. You know, As we saw in uh, this example here, uh, the calibration step essentially means that you would have certain handout data set that you would keep from your original data set. In some cases, even calibrating on random data, we have seen that you can preserve the accuracy to a lot of extent with 98-bit. And that's one of the reasons why that 8-bit integer representation is extremely popular uh, to deploy on real-world systems. Having said that, we do have different uh, you know, other uh, positions that are supported. Uh, but typically when you go down below 98-bit representation, for example, at 4-bit level or lower, you would have to do a certain amount of retraining and fine-tuning of your models, which may mean that the architecture of the model may change a little bit. Uh, in many cases, we found that most of our customers uh, prefer to keep the original architecture as it is, as they have invested a lot of time and effort in designing a particular application. and. Uh, the INT 8-bit representation has been the most preferred route to deploy that in production. Sure, sure, yeah, yeah, it has become the most popular. There's a lot of work still to see if, you know, how much, how well you can maintain accuracy at lower precision, but INT 8 has pretty much become the standard for edge AI inference. Um, and I would, 
Right. And I would also say that there are uh, certain applications where we find that mixed precision is a better approach. And that's another aspect. I just wanted to make the audience aware of the fact that it is possible to have int 8 bit mixed with uh, in a four bit representation, or some parts of the model could be at a higher representation as well. Um, and, and that's something that the software is, it's very important that you have software that can take that into account. The second mm. aspect is, um, you know, we talked about the fact that we support heterogeneity in terms of host processes. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is there could be cases as a co-processor, uh, if you're deploying a real world model, it could be that there are certain operators you don't support on the hardware unless and until you're deploying on a general purpose system. In that mm -hmm. case, you may have to go back to your host and you would want the software to be able to preserve and that host may not support int 8 bit In most cases, it may support FP16, FP32. So you need the software to be flexible, to have higher mm -hmm. uh, precision support when you go back to the host, perhaps for operators which are not uh, neural network operators, and then come back uh, to the accelerator to have a lot more efficient acceleration of the neural network components under 8-bit representation or lower representation if you have that flexibility. Got it, got it, yeah. And it's it's important that the, the software framework allow the developer, the customer, to, to make those trends and evaluate the effect uh, before they go to the final product. And so you briefly mentioned that the simulator, the profiler, I think it'd be worth talking more about that. How, how does that enable uh, the users to, to evaluate those various trade-offs. Sure, absolutely. So let me see, I might have a slide here, let me pull that up. So one of the critical aspects of profiling uh, is the ability to decide um, what kind of performance, efficiency uh, we can extract from a particular model, as well as identify whether that model can run at the first place whether there are certain critical bottlenecks in the model that we are trying to deploy on that actual hardware. Keeping that in mind, we developed our compiler stack uh, to have different levels of abstraction. And what you see here are this, those different levels of abstraction. At the most simplest level, we enable something called an interpreter hardware, which is essentially uh, an almost an emulation platform as a simplest node where you execute that machine learning computational graph under minimal effort. And it, it is not designed to run it under the most efficient mode, but it tells you whether you can compile that model in the first place and whether there are certain bottleneck or areas in that model or multiple models that you're trying to deploy, such that you can go back and make those changes to the model if you have to, or uh, you can also decide whether you have you figure out whether you have lost accuracy when you use int 8 bit and deploy the model do you need to recalibrate your model? All of those can be done during that interpreter hardware level. The second level of abstraction that we have from a profiling perspective is a simulator. And we provide the simulator in two levels. There's a C++-based simulator, which is extremely fast, and a functional simulator, not completely accurate, but that will give you enough data to tell you what is the expected performance that you can get. Typically, between the simulator and the actual workload, you'll see some amount of difference in the order of 5 to 10%. But that gives you very quickly whether your model compiles, how long it takes to compile, and how long it takes to actually run that model if you were to run that on the actual hardware. And here, you have the ability to choose whether that hardware is the FPGA or that hardware is an ASIC. The third level is uh, a, a lot more deeper cycle accurate, uh, you know, uh, simulator that gives you the ability to run that directly at the RTL level. And as a result, you can now have a lot more cycle accurate numbers, which matches nearly uh, the actual number that you will get on the hardware in terms of the performance that you can get uh, of the different models that you're trying to run. What you see on the extreme right-hand side is an example of our web-based profiling or visualization tool that enables you to easily select the model. Uh, for example, you can either uh, select different types of models that are available through a model zoo. By the way, you can take a look at that, uh, the audience on, on GitHub. If you go to our um, the Mera page, you'll see that there are already a uh, number of models provided on the model zoo. You can also pull a model out of Torch Vision or TensorFlow Hub, or you can also add a model from your side. It also enables you to select the different resolutions, which is very important from a profiling perspective. Uh, you know, in most cases, ResNet, um, 52 to 4, 2 to 4 is not really the actual resolution that you will run on a real system. 
you're probably running that at very high resolution, 2K or 4K. So it's very important to choose the profiling for those resolutions. And then it also enables you to select the batch size, whether that's batch size one, which is most critical for most edge workloads or larger batch sizes. And once you do that, the profiling tool will actually run that and settle on the best configuration. As you see here uh, in the top example, uh, for one of the models, it shows the red curve, the red bar is the best configuration for that particular resolution. And at the bottom one, you know, the, the blue one is the most efficient one. So it'll select and tell you which is the most efficient one so that now you can make an informed choice to select those parameters to deploy that on the actual hardware. And for that, we provide a, a abstraction called IP, which is the compiler target used to deploy on the actual hardware, the ASIC or the FPGA. So those are some components of the profiler that the customer can easily use to fine tune and test out the performance out of the box. Got it, got it. And so using these tools then the, the, the designer, the developer can optimize for throughput or, or lowest latency, what have you, they can choose different objectives in, in their optimization target. That's correct, that's exactly right. Uh, and in fact, um, you know, um, in the same context of the profiling mechanism, let me talk a little bit more about the scheduler, right? Which is critically important. Another aspect of what, you know, what we built into Mera itself was a dual mode of the scheduler itself, where in, in one mode, we provide a very fast scheduler. That's pretty much, a, you know, immediate go where you get a model, as long as it compiles, the scheduler essentially is going to compile that, keeping into mind, uh, deploying that on the hardware resources without necessarily optimizing all aspects of what is available on the hardware. That will compile in extremely fast and you'll be able to validate that functional performance uh, or you know the functionality of that model, but you may not get the, ex uh, the extreme level of performance or efficiency that you want. The second mode that we have is essentially an optimized scheduling mode. During that mode, we run various different types of optimization algorithms, uh, we call this mutations. As a result, it will take into account, it will search through an optimization space that enables you to extract the most value out of that underlying hardware, taking into account amount of on-chip memory that you have, the total amount of compute that you have, as well as other uh, aspects like batch size, the, the actual resolution of the data. And as you can see, using that optimized scheduling mode, in many cases, we achieve up to 57% speed up in fact, for many complex workloads, we have seen even greater speed ups growing from the fast scheduling to the optimized scheduling mode. Right. Yeah, I think that this is again an important point. It's not just about being able to convert the network from FP32 to int8, it's, it's optimizing it, uh, the compiler, the scheduler, the entire framework uh, that, that uh, anybody looking to develop an IJI application should be looking for. Um, uh, I had more questions and, and uh, some comments here coming in from the audience, but I think we're about running out of time. So I think this is probably a good point to, to stop and wrap up. And Sakia, first, I guess, I ask you any, any calls to action or other things that you would like to say to, to wrap up for the audience. No, sure. You know, th thanks, Mike, for those excellent questions. And hopefully this was uh... You know, useful for the audience. Um, I think one aspect that I didn't touch upon, if you have a couple of minutes, let me just touch upon that fact. I think it's very important to understand for the audience. And that aspect is this aspect of core design, which is, you know, the core integral component of what we do as a company. Uh, and I think that's very important for people who are thinking about software. In many cases, in real world deployments, you'll find that it's not just uh, the actual performance, but you're looking at a mixture of the hardware level performance, which could be latency, it could be on-chip memory, it could be the die area, which has a direct impact on the power. And then equivalently, you're looking at the accuracy metrics of a neural network uh, or bit precision that we talked about, whether it's INT 8-bit or INT 4-bit, how do you actually make that decision? To enable that, we uh, design an automated platform that enables you to do that co-design process, searching through the space of the models, while also searching through the space of the RTL design of your accelerator such that you can settle on one architecture which is really software driven, which is giving you the right choice of the types of models, as well as the right choice of the hardware architecture that you would want to deploy that, taking into account your power metrics your or power targets, latency targets, as well as accuracy targets. 
And that is uh, really the way we designed DNA, which was baked into Sakura, ultimately driven by the software. So if there's one take home message, what I want to really leave the audience with is that software is the critical component and uh, the ability to co-design is very important uh, uh, when it comes to silicon design. Uh, it's not just the hardware. And as we talked about, you know, the scheduler, the compiler are critical components of that uh, software stack to extract the most value out of any AI acceleration hardware in the market today. Okay. Thanks, Sakia. Uh, I think it's covered a lot of territory. I think if I understand the platform right, people can continue to enter questions and we'll follow up um, after the webinar. Uh, but other than that, I thank everybody for attending. Uh, and I'll turn it back over to Aaron. Aaron, are you there? Thank you very much both. Um, very insightful and obviously, you know, the M part co-design, huge topic, um, one of which we will be covering in September. So I uh, look forward to continuing that discussion there. So that does conclude today's webinar. Sakia, Mike, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for the detailed discussion. I've seen a, a number of comments come in already about how detailed and how, how helpful and useful the conversation was. So like I said, I'm looking forward very much to, to continuing those and seeing you in, in person, Sakia, and deliver it on stage next time. And if you have enjoyed today's discussions, like we've said several times, we will be back in person this September um, for Edge AI, Edge AI Summit and AI Hardware Summit. Join us, your colleagues, your peers, the leading machine learning, hardware and system specialists in Santa Clara. Um, dates are September 13th to 15th. And yeah, Stakia will be presented across both events on behalf of Edge Cortex. Um, he'll be joined by a, a wealth of knowledge, expertise um, from across the industry. We look forward to uh, meeting you all there in person. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, both.